or maybe this one is better, maybe I should. <laughs> 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 just hold You can dance if you, if you do it like this, you can dance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I. <laughs> Hello, could you? It's not for air. Yeah. Dobrý večer. Dobrý večer. So I think we are ready to start and maybe first a little warning. If you came for to see and watch the famous football player Luis Suarez, this is not the right discussion. So you can leave now. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So if you are here to see about to hear about this football player, you know, you should better leave because this is going to be about communication. And the Luis Suarez we have here is the guy from IBM, a guy whose job is not to be a football player, but who is a social computing evangelist at That's IBM. Right. But how, how does it come that ordinary soccer player has a better CEO than social media guru? At Google. Actually, he doesn't. If you Google Luis Suarez on Google.com, at least Let me do I, I, checked, I checked it out the day before yesterday, I was number one. No, but maybe he did something other by the weekend that screwed my CEO thing ratings up, and then he came up again. No, apparently one. there are some negotiations about him being bought by Bayern, so he jumped over there you. There goes my Google. CEO again. Okay. So today it's not going to be about football. It's going to be about communication. It's going to be about it's a email-free territory. It's now. a soccer player. Soccer. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> and so. Because it's about communication, we encourage you to communicate as well, and we encourage you to, it should be more like a chaotic Facebook discussion, so whenever you have a question, please ask, raise your hand, there is a lady in a white skirt that has a microphone, so you could ask wherever you want, just don't keep all your questions for the end. So let me now introduce you officially, so this is Luis Suarez, he grew up in Galicia, yeah. and yeah. And he became an English teacher moving to Britain, but over a wild party weekend in Amsterdam. He saw this advertisement that IBM in Amsterdam was looking for people. He applied, I don't know whether you were sober at the time, you know, maybe you could go in more details about Let's this. Let's say that I was on a Sunday morning with a heavy headache. Okay. And he applied for a job and he got a job, it was 1997. And since then he's working for IBM. And I think I, I don't have to introduce uh, Milos Cermak because he's here to be, or he was supposed to be here as the, as the diehard fan of email, but since he stopped answering my emails, maybe he joined like five years ago. Yeah, <laughs> position. But I think Milos doesn't need no introduction. He's sort of evangelist himself. I think the only difference I see before... I'm not paid by IBM. Yeah, and the other difference I see is that he is living in Gran Canaria and you live in Prague, so I think one of you got a better deal. Well, I don't know. This is a beautiful city. I mean, well, I have a better deal, she meant. Yeah, 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 I, okay. That's what I meant, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so what we... I'll tell you that on the beach this coming Thursday when you're here and I'm on the beach. I hate you. So maybe let's start about as we as we planned before about your hate speech about emails because you are the guy who is most famous for publicly divorcing email. You ditched your inbox five years ago. You are still alive, and so maybe start talking about why you hate email so much, and then we ask Milos why he loves them. All right, good. Um, first thing, th these chairs are all empty. We don't bite. You can come closer. This is supposed to be a fire chart site. So you guys that stand in there, please have a seat here. We don't bite. Thank you. If we bite, that's because we have said something that is going to hurt you, right? But don't worry, we're not going to. But feel free to come forward, you know. This is supposed to be a conversation. We don't like chairs in between that are empty, yeah? So come over. Don't so don't worry they will catch anti-email virus. No, they won't. From you. <laughs> they won't. They may get inspired, which is different, right? So. And we will see how that inspiration goes. But I they mean, still don't go to the first row. Yeah, 
because that seems to be like too empty. But look, they're coming already, they're approaching. So, no, no, on the back, on the back. Come on, come on, guys. We don't bite, seriously. Come on, there you go. You see? Oh, almost. <laughs> Damn, you know, need to work on my convincing You seem to be very successful in influencing people not to use email, but when it comes to first row, it's not Struggling. your so this cup one of is, tea. This one is full, though. You know, so they are my IBM time. employees. No, they're not. <laughs> he's not. He's not. Right? He's not. So he's there. So anyway, um, like I said, if those are standing on the back, there's still space here, yeah? So don't worry. We're not going to bite you. I promise. Well, maybe. The, well, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> So um, the hate email speech. Um, it's interesting to, to, for me to notice how most people feel that I'm the guy who wants to kill email. At least that's how people perceive me um, from the perspective of saying, ah, yeah, this is Luis Suarez, the one who wants to kill email. Not really. I don't want to kill email. My, my speech over the last five years is that I don't want email dead. I want email being repurposed into doing proper things, right? So what are proper things? Communicate. And, and, and actually, if you guys think about email, email has been there for 40 years. So probably it's been there way before all of you were born. I was one year old when email was born. So imagine that, right? So I've been using that technology for 40 years. And yet, when we started, or when Fox started using email back then, email was an alert system a messaging system of content stored elsewhere. Then the 90s came over, and someone decided that it was a great idea to place attachments and fancy format and lovely bold italics and whatever other crap, right? Because it's all crap, essentially. And someone said, oh, there you go. You see, I won the argument. Lovely. Thank you. I'll buy your coffee later on. Don't worry. And no one else will get the coffee. Yes, dear. So, um, Someone decided in the, in the mid-90s to actually go and play its attachments, to put their reply to all, right? And all of a sudden, email has stopped becoming an alert system and become a content repository. That was the place where work happened. You know, how, um, you know if I go and ask you guys, what is the number one tool that you use today at work, you would probably say email by far. Anyone here who wouldn't say otherwise? Anyone? No. All of you use email as the primary communication tool. Now, raise your hand. How many of you would want to kill email today by can't? Good half of the room. The other ones are liars. They want to kill email. They just don't want to raise their hand so that the boss that is watching may be having problems with it. Right? Um, the interesting thing here, what's happening, is that email has transformed itself into a content repository. And all of a sudden, we see social networking tools coming up, social media, right? And I'm not just talking about Facebook. I'm talking about all of the major league players like LinkedIn, like Google+, like Twitter, like SlideShare, like Tumblr, or whatever else, right? And then, obviously, the enterprise social software vendors like Jive, Yammer, SharePoint, Connections, Chatter, whatever you guys have out there. And all of a sudden, the social networking tools are helping us understand that email needs to go back to its place to what it was designed for 40 years ago, which is a messaging and notification system of content that's stored elsewhere in social networks. So my hate email speech is not so much as to, I want email dead, I want email to go back into its cage, which is basically an alert system, right? And I want everyone to kind of like think for themselves as to how they interact at work and what, what will happen if instead of hoarding and protecting your knowledge in your inbox, you actually shared it openly with everyone out there, what would happen then? Would that people allow you to keep your job? Would people say, like, you know, I cannot live without email? Here's the context. I've been doing that for five years in perhaps the most email-driven company ever, IBM. That's what IBMers will tell you, yeah? And yet, no one has fired me. Yet. <laughs> yeah, five years later. So um, initially, though, the reaction from my colleagues was, you're crazy. You're not going to survive. We're going to give you two weeks before you're fired. Why? Because your boss will want to communicate with you, and because he cannot use email with you, you're going to be fired. I said, really? Let's see. That's five years ago. Right? Not two weeks, five years ago. So here's the thing. I want to challenge you all. 
how email is taking place today of how we work, right? But I want to challenge you all with something very simple, and then I'm just going to hand it over to, to you guys so you can continue. I want you to all think, what would happen if I go back to the office tomorrow and I don't open my mailbox? What happens then? And then we will get some questions for you guys as we present all our stories and everything else, right? So I'll come back to that question later. So think about the answer. What will happen if you go tomorrow to work and you don't open your inbox for the entire day? Nirvana. Nirvana. <laughs> Someone said Nirvana here. Okay, we're getting closer. You see, I didn't need to do much evangelizing on that one. Yeah, so think about it because part of your answers are going to also direct the discussions that we're going to have later on on how we can switch that mentality from privacy, from obscurity, from politics, from bullying, into openness and transparency from that perspective. It's maybe because I don't remember the pre-email time in work. So what's so wrong with email? Was work before email more exciting or was it, the, was it shorter or what's so wrong with emails? I came sort of like in between. So when I joined the company, when I joined IBM, email was there, but it was used in the mainframe, right? So the system that typically banks run nowadays still, right? So what happened before email? Well, people talked. Funny, right? But people talked. People had conversations on the corridors. People basically used to work on a single project with a single team on the same building, right? So they all talked to one another. They all went out for lunch together. They all shared their experiences. They all bitched about one another face to face. Then we started becoming more complex. Then collaboration became virtual. Then people started working in different buildings with different customers, different projects. And face-to-face -face was no longer a reality. So what happened then was email came to the rescue to help us. And it did good. And it did very good. Email is still a very powerful communication tool. What happens is that email is not the problem. We are the problem. We abuse the tool every single day. How do we abuse the tool all the time? Engaging in stupid, silly, political, bullying games. Mine is bigger than yours, and yours is bigger than mine. So today I have 300 emails. How many did you have? So I'm going to go and CC your boss, and your boss's boss, that you haven't done your work. Because I'm much more powerful than you are when I CC people. Or I'm going to send you this lovely attachment of 50 MB. Can you check out my presentation, please? Or the other, my favorite use case, how many times have you guys received 50 times the same question from 50 different people? And you have to answer copy and paste. That's, that's what we call, or what I would call, the bad habits of using email. Right? It's, it's habits that we have created ourselves so that we can get away with it. Right? And, and the biggest one, the biggest one is that email is the biggest delegation machine out there. So you basically dump your work into someone else. And whoever doesn't admit that, they're lying through the nose again. Because we do that every day. Yeah, can you help me fix this problem, please? Or can you help me put it together this presentation? You're not saying, can you help me? You're actually saying, can you do this for me? So you're basically dumping your work onto someone else. And because someone else is not stupid, they're going to dump their work onto you. And that's when we start killing our productivity. We don't get the work done enough because we decided to engage in this silly tin tennis ping pong game of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And at the end of the day, you go like, wow, I achieved inbox zero. You look back, you look back again, and you have got 100 emails coming back. I felt like, yes, good luck with that. So I think there is a strong case being made against email, and I think your position now is not well, <laughs> the don't, easiest don't, one. Don't expect uh, uh, from me to have a laugh speech for for email, um, but I have to correct you. Email was invented even before you were born. It was 1971. No, that it was. I was one year old when email was already there. So I was born in 1972. Okay. So email was yeah. already there. Okay. So it was 1971, wasn't it? Um, well, uh, it's maybe the way how it's done in IBM that you are, do, you are bullying yourselves, uh, each other. I'm not corporate guy, so uh, I'm getting all the emails second. from my good friends. And Hang on for a second. Let me find this. Am I the only one feeling that way about being bullied by email at work and your own companies? 
Raise your hand if you're not. If you're not bullied or, or playing political games in your company. Raise your hand, please. Two people. Yeah. Three. We are four, a nice country without uh, five. So five out of fifty, sixty are saying that they're being bullied and that they play political games at work. And and I tell you, the rest, these people that don't work for IBM. So we're not alone. Hopefully they don't work for IBM. We are not sure we check <laughs> when they are leaving. Maybe. Uh, but I, I really don't expect any, any, any um, love speech uh, about email. But I think still it's a nice tool. Uh, I sent my email in, even be, it, it was before the web, in 1991. Uh, I, I didn't have the email address then, but, but I, I sent my first email so early. And um, I think a lot of people, they just stop to use email, uh, especially young people, teenagers. My kids, they don't use it at all. They use it only if they want to print something and they send it to me by email. And, uh, with, and subject line is, print this. So this is my only email communication with my kids. So they don't use it anymore. So I think it's really corporate thing. And it, it's not the fault of, of, um, of the tool but it's the fall of corporations. So you probably should be not the um, email hater, but the corporate hater. Because I think what happened to it's, email you are also... You're talking only about corporations. Okay. You, you mostly talk about IBM, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think what Milos is saying is that what happened to, me, to email happened before to meetings. I think meet, you know, who is here not being bullied by meetings? You know, it's the same thing, so... Yes, you're absolutely right, right? Um, and here's the thing, corporations are the big culprit of doing that. And, and you guys know why? I'll tell you why, but tell me why. Why do you think, why do you think that corporations behave that way? Give me, give me some answers. Come on, let's make this interactive. Why do you feel that corporations I, I have, that was abuse? So let's get, let's get the mic going there, right? So why, and I 100% 100, 100 agree with, with Milo's comment about being the corporations and the culprit. And I'll tell you what I think is the number one reason. But I want to hear your reason as well. So go ahead. I think it's uh, because no one knows what the others are doing. No one knows what the other ones are doing. Or who is Gosh, responsible. I love you, man. Come on here and sit with us. <laughs> You're going to enjoy this panel. Absolutely. So that's, that's a huge thing. So how funny it is that the lack of transparency and openness is what actually gets us to fight with one another because we don't know what we're doing. So that's one thing. So what else? Tell me some more. Come on, raise your hand. Tell us what do you think is the main reason why we corporations behave that way. If you don't tell me anything, that means that you agree with it and we have got a problem. Come on. Maybe some well-experienced people from IBM? Yes, <laughs> maybe. You guys can also speak up if you want to. I'm not going to go and beat you yet. <laughs> Come on, everyone else. I mean, you, you guys are all saying, here we have got another one with the mic. One second. Look, six years ago there were no other tools, or seven or ten years ago. So the corporation just used the email to get together closer instead of the voice calling. Right. And then they, they learned the way they, they use the email. They right. can't get rid of it. Because it was our only way out of the yeah. firewall when interacting with customers and business partners. Correct. That's absolutely right. And ten, and ten years ago... The telephone was invented, I think, I don't know, 19th century? That's <laughs> right, but on the telephone, you cannot prove that you have done something unless you record it. With email, you always have proof because we don't know what we're doing. Remember that? You are not recording your phone conversation in IBM? Never. No? Okay. And if we do it, we have to ask for mutual agreement, which is something that you cannot do in, on email that well, right? But that's a great point. So you, at the time, it was the only option, right? Now, interesting enough, 10 years later, is email is still the only option? No. So why do we keep making it the only option? So what else? What are the reasons? Come on. Don't be quiet. Share. Control. control. Yes. Yes, sir. Control. Control of what? Because, you know, control is a fully loaded word. Control of what? What are you controlling? What are we controlling? Right, exactly. We control, you know, one of the interesting things of how corporations have been running is controlling their employees by making them feel that they are the ones making the decisions when they don't make the decisions. Right, that's controlling. And how do you do that? By selectively sharing your information through your mail that you send 
on a need to know basis. So I only share my knowledge with you when you need it. And for the rest, you can go and screw yourself up. And excuse my French, but that's how corporations work, right? You still having you still having given the number one reason why corporations do this. Give me some more reasons. Come on, let that brain think. Be because it's because it's easier to communicate. It is. In fact, correct, correct. But I'm going to question that, for instance, because certainly the perception is that email is very easy. But it's easy if I know your email address. Do I know your email address? Do I know your email address? So how easy it's going to be for me to communicate with you if I don't know your email address? We can find out if you want. <laughs> no, 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 no. He but, no, but here's the thing. Here's, no, here's my point. Is that it's easy. It's relatively easy, right? In the sense that I need to know your email address. But guess what? We may have a coffee later on, and I may ask your name. I can Google you, just your name and your entire social presence will show up in front of my first page. And I have got multiple ways of engaging with you. So which one is easier? The one where I don't know until I ask your email address and you can tell me, no, I can't tell you. Or the one where I just ask your name and I find all your entire social history. Yeah. First name point, second name. At yeah, company. Don't not know. necessarily. Mine doesn't have the point. Mine has got something else than the point. <laughs> you are one of these strange companies They don't have points? In no, no, we have got something else than points, right? No, some people, some people do underscore, some other people do hyphen, some other Losers people just do, do the same name. Pardon? Regular people do points, losers do underscore. I, I have read it, I have read it in some manual. There is some research that manual. losers use the, use the underscore, go figure, right? Does anybody have right? <laughs> underscore in it? But the interesting email thing there, the interesting, the interesting, oh my God. The, in <laughs> the interesting thing there is that it's perceived as something being easy, and I'm willing to challenge that perhaps it's not that easy. And, and not just from the perspective of how I can find your details and how you can you know, withdraw that email, but think about it as well. Just because it is easy for you to send an email does not necessarily mean that it's easy for the receiver of the email. For them, it's not easy. For them, it's getting constantly hammered by emails just like you are. So that's when it becomes no longer easy. Now, I'm going to ask you guys, you all work for more or less small, medium, large companies. So do you work for a company where you have got a mail quota on your mail? So once you exceed that quota, you can no longer respond to emails? I know that Google gives you, like Gmail gives you like 10 gigs, but hello, that's not happening. That doesn't happen in the corporate world. You're lucky if you get 150 MB, yeah? So what happens then is that it's easy for you to send the email but if you send two or three emails with attachments of 50 MB, you block the entire work day of that person. And that person will remember your entire family name. <laughs> For good. For good. Yeah? So the number one reason why corporations do that um, is because of something called divide and conquer. You guys know that? So divide your workforce so they're not smart enough to work together and make themselves better than me as the one running the company. That's the reason why corporations are so good at it. That's why corporations have got something called bonuses. That's how corporations use gamification constantly to gain the system so that the one small fraction who runs corporations keeps on power for centuries, while the rest of us who do the vast majority of the work don't. Hello to the welcome to the 21st century. That's about to change. How? Stop using email. And we'll do you know any, cor or any corporation that decided to ditch the email the way you did? And I know. In fact, I know corporations who have already not been using internal email for 10 years. There, is, there, are, two French com sorry, there are two Belgian companies. Uh, actually, no. It's one company in Belgium and another company in the States. They're small, they're small businesses, right? So it's not like 480,000 people. But they have got <clears throat> significant number, so it's like between 100 to 500 employees. And for instance, the one that I know in Belgium has not been using internal email for 10 years. So I tell them, so why didn't you write about that 
all along to show us the better way. I mean, I've been doing this for five years, and now I find out that you guys have been doing it for another five more years. And the people say, yeah, we were scared that people would not like the story. I go like, what? Excuse me, you are leading, innovating, telling everyone that it's possible to have a corporate environment free of email. You guys probably have heard about Atos, Atos Origin. It's a large corporation, 75,000 people across the globe. They have set up a plan of three years to kill email by January next year, internally. In three years, for 75,000 people. But these are French. They, they don't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. I will tell them. <laughs> no, um, actually, they have, they're going to have more challenges than, than that one, right? Um, because one of the things that is happening is that email is a very hierarchical tool. So companies that are very hierarchical are going to have an issue with abandoning email, right? So we will have to see how they react to that hierarchy. So what but typically happens when the company decides to stop using emails? What changes within the company or what should change within well the, the main the main changes that company go through is that they become more open they become more transparent right so all of a sudden so so what essentially happens is that people stop living the mantra that knowledge is power right so if i share my knowledge i share my power so people typically don't share their knowledge because they feel that they're going to give their power right? was it like that before really no. When there were no emails no, and everybody was no, locked in his no, no, office no, 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 and no, that's, his room? No, no, that's not the case. That's how, that's how the vast majority of Western Europe has worked, right? So knowledge is power. And yes, what I keep telling people is that knowledge shared is what's power. The more knowledge you share, the more powerful you are. And people tell me, how can that be? I say, well, because the more people know about you. So imagine that I'm a thought leader. Imagine. Right? I don't think I am, but imagine that I'm a thought leader. Right? So how can I be a thought leader if you do not know what I'm good at? How can that be knowledge is power? How can I tell people I'm this super wonderful, magnificent guru, social media guru, if I spend a whole day stuck in my inbox? What kind of a thought leader is that? You guys tell me. You guys tell me how can someone say that they're very good at a particular skill if they can share that knowledge, if they can demonstrate what their knowledge and expertise and a skill is. You can't. You won't be able to. And that's the main problem. The main problem that we have is that we need to tell people that, or we need to start thinking for ourselves that this is about not knowledge is power, it's knowledge shared is power. It's the more I share my knowledge, the more powerful I become. Why? Because my knowledge is no longer mine. It's from my networks. So I basically share what I know with all of them. Right? And you're going to tell me, yeah, but if I do that, I lose my job. Really? Do we still think that in the 21st century? I'm going to lose a job anyway. The way things are going, you know, you guys probably know about the situation in Spain, right? In Spain, we have an interesting uh, problem right now where around 26% of our active working population, they are unemployed. That's huge compared to the 12% that you guys have over here, more or less, right? But it gets worse because if you go to under 25 people, that's 56% of unemployment. How the fuck do you fix that? And excuse my French. Now, what do I mean, how do I fix that? Well, that fix, fix, look at that. Europe is the oldest country, the oldest continent in the world right now. We are aging at alarming rates. In five, ten years, we will not have people to transfer our knowledge to, the younger generations. Why? Because they don't use email. You just mentioned it. So I have got people who have been 20, 35 years in the company who have got huge amounts of knowledge in their inboxes What's the first thing that HR does when you leave a company? Tell me. Deletes everything. And that deletes everything is your mailbox, your HR record, your employee director, everything. So exactly, to the company, you no longer exist. Isn't it sad that you spend 30 years or 25 years or 10 years of your life and you leave the company and no one knows anything about you? 
talking about leaving a legacy behind. That's what it's all about. So, you know, she was asking me, what is the impact of opening up and using all of these communication tools and social tools and everything else? That is what it's all about. It's about switching from knowledge is power to knowledge shared is power, but it's also switching from a need to know basis, sharing mentality, into sharing everything publicly by default unless you have been told otherwise. So unless you're dealing with confidential content, right, like HR personal data, like financial details, like legal or whatever else, there's no reason why you should say everything else out in the open. Why would you do that? Well, to show and demonstrate your thought leadership. If you're not capable of doing that, you may not be the thought leader that you think you are. Why? Because no one will know you. This is way beyond how much you know. This is, so this is, you know, our, our, our CEO, Ginny Rometty, a couple of weeks back. Is she using email or? She doesn't. She's actually, I mean, she probably does use email with, with some of her peers as senior vice presidents, but she's also one of our strongest advocates and users of social networking tools. And she's got a community where she engages with everyone in the company doing video blogging. Right? She gets her lovely iPad, puts it on the table, and she starts recording herself. Can you imagine a CEO doing that? She does it, right? But no, what I was going to say is that two weeks ago she did um, a presentation for the uh, Foreign Council Group in the, U in the US, which is a non-profit organization. And she mentioned there something which I think is critical for what it will mean for us in the 21st century, which is essentially um, very soon companies are going to start measuring employees not about what they know, but because of what they share and how they share it. So we're seeing that switch from what you know does no longer matter as long as you don't share it across. So that's the thing, that's the challenge, is how do I go and share that knowledge across with my networks to get my job done from that perspective, right? Yeah, but the obsession with sharing could end up being as dangerous as the obsession of sending emails. You know, we are people and we are prone to no. Ru ruin good ideas. No, and, and, and here's, here's, uh, there are two things that I want to mention on that one. The first one is, one thing is what happens on Facebook, where we seem to overshare everything, right? And the main reason why we do that is because no one knows what we do, and therefore we need to make ourselves visible, and I want to share everything, even what I have for breakfast in the morning. And another thing is what happens in a business context, where you know already that person. You can look up that person, you can find all of the different interesting interactions that they have been doing. So that problem of oversharing, we're not going to say it behind the firewall. And the reason why we're going to not say it behind, behind the firewall is because we would not want to embarrass ourselves sharing a stuff that we know is silly, like pictures of cats or silly videos, right? Because you can do that through email, but only a small amount of people will see how steady you are. If you do that on a social network behind a firewall, where in my case, 480,000 people can see that, you're sort of like exposing your silliness to a certain degree, right? So what's happening on that topic of the oversharing is that contrary to what most people's perceptions are, when you start using social networking tools behind a firewall, you won't share as much as you're doing now through email or as much as you're doing on public networks. Why? Because you have got a job to do. Remember? So you're not there to goof around like you can on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever else. You're doing there to do a job, which is what you have been paid for. So what you're doing is you're, doing in, you're moving interactions and you become a little more collaborative with people on how you actually interact from that perspective. Milos, would you like to be measured by the amount and the quality of what you are sharing and pay it according I'm sharing to a lot. <laughs> so, um, I, I agree. Uh, I, I think it's um, it's a viable concept. And, and but but you know you, you are from two big company. It's it's a lot of people working for IBM. It's four hundred eighty thousand. Mm -hmm. So you are always talking about uh, life behind the firewall and. Mm -hmm. Uh, in front of firewall, which is not the case of uh, most of us. We, we just, uh, most of us work for much smaller companies and uh, so we maybe don't have the um, the problem with email in so extent that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't get uh, 100 emails on 
uh, CC copy every day. So um, basically, I not I, yet. I have to. Well, I'm not going to get it. This I, I don't think I, I will get it in the future. I'm only getting a couple of emails of angry readers, and that's, mm -hmm. that's just it. And mostly now people are uh, just writing their frustrations on Facebook, so they don't send email in anymore. So. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe it's much more problem of really big corporation than 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 the tool itself. I, I would say still again, as I said before. But, but do you believe in this trend of open business of a business where everything is transparent, everybody is sharing? I don't know. I really have to. Uh, I think Louis is uh, talking a lot about the internal communication, about the internal relationship between you and your boss, and boss of your boss, and boss of your boss of. Uh, his own boss, and it, it's a lot of people. Um, and uh, you are maybe a little bit obsessed by the corporate culture and corporate relations. But I think for most companies, like medium sized companies, small companies, email is much more the tool for communication between itself and, I don't know, customers, other people. For me, email is a tool of communication to, I don't know, my friends mostly. Um, so I think for, for small companies, for, for, for um, individual people, email still is a very effective tool. And it's, um, I don't know, for example, I don't know what, what Belgian company quit email 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know what business they are in. But uh, I think 10 years ago for any company it would be very difficult, I don't know, to get communication from their customers to get um, anything so but this was this company was internal email not customer email okay yeah? so, so that's still different. use customer so, email so we're still talking right. about internal right and for me it's just still talk about the corporate culture about right. what is wrong uh, with, 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 right. with with corporations but there are a couple of things in there as well right um, the number one is and you said it yourself and at least I like this kind of debate right your kids are not using email that's what you told us. Well, unless, the, unless they want you the to school, print they are something. Not, they are not right? working so your kids, in say ten years, they're going to be part of the workforce, even for your no, small they, company. I hope sooner. I hope oh, sooner than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even better. I have old kids. Yeah. Even better. Even better. So that means that in five years, maybe. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully, five years. Even uh, at least the boy. At least the boy. Yeah, yeah. So in five years, they will be part of the working population, oh, yes. right? <laughs> and then you can just go and think about retiring and all that stuff. To Canary Island. So maybe I'm more than welcome to come over. So, so what's can, happening there? Email every evening. That's right, more or less. So what happens then is that that generation has already made the switch. Right? So whether they work for large corporations or small businesses, they have already made the switch. But here's, here's my case. Um, even, if, even as a small business, you would still have a need to use these social networking tools. Right? Perhaps not so much to collaborate internally. That's a good point. And that's actually a valid, but valid point. But here's the scenario. Would you risk not being on social networking tools as your primary driver of interactions with your customers, knowing that your competitors are already there? Whether you're a small business or a medium business or large business, you have all competitors like we do. They're already trying to snatch your customers away from you on social channels. Why? Because that's where customers go and beach nowadays. They go and complain on Twitter, on Facebook or whatever that, yeah, these products suck. It's better if they complain in emails, isn't it? <laughs> no. It would Why? be better, I think. Why would it be better in email? Well, for the company. Definitely. Why? Well, it's better if uh, not the competition is not reading yeah, these emails. I want my competition and my products suck. Why would you think? Why would you say that I would say? Why would you think that I would say that? Why would I say because that I want you are my the evangelist and not the CEO? Okay. No. No. <laughs> Why would you think, why would you, and I actually truly believe that, right? And this is, this is you know, um, you were mentioning earlier on about open business and open communication. This has got a lot to do with that. Why would I go and tell everyone out there that, you know, my products, my products suck? Whether they do or not, I don't care. Why would I do that? What do you think, what do you guys think I would do that? Because they suck? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's no such thing as bad publicity? No. No. 
No, that there is a way of doing good publicity, right? No, that the main thing, or the main reason why I would say that is because that's where I can grow my products. If someone goes out there and tells me that my products are wonderful, what else is there for me to do? How can I improve those products if everyone tells me that my products are wonderful? What's after wonderful? Nothing is after wonderful. If someone tells me that my products are bad and they suck, I have got a huge amount of room for improvement right there to get my act together and fix those problems. But guess what? Because my customers are already complaining in that scenario that the products are not working, I'm introducing something there that email is not providing, which is co-creation. So my customers tell me, yeah, this product is actually really bad. The usability sucks, and I can't get work done with it. So fix it. And me, as the person who sells that product as a vendor, will go back and tell you, wonderful feedback. How do you want me to fix it? First, what is broken? Why is it broken? What's the use case scenario? How would you like to see it improve? And most importantly, do you want to work together with me in a direct dialogue where we can fix that. Do you see email doing that? Social networks are doing that today already. There's a whole concept of co-creation. More and more customers are demanding this communication open and transparency. More and more customers, whether you're a small, or small business or medium business or large enterprise, they want to know what you do behind the firewall, behind your firewall. They want to know how you run the operations. They want to know how you develop products. They want to know why a product is bad. So they can help you, telling you how it can be fixed. Right? Now the interesting conversation from that perspective is that you have got two choices. Ignore it, which is what a good number of companies have done. And that's when the competition comes over and beats the crap out of you. Kodak, you guys know Kodak? Right? A company that was there for 175 years, I think it was in the photography business, and they went bankrupt because they didn't listen to the end users doing digital photography. Hello? Did it take you 175 years to figure that out? Apparently, yes, and they didn't come back, right? Now, look into, for instance, what happens with Apple. Do you guys know what the social strategy from Apple is? Do you guys know it? You won. It doesn't have one. Sample, Apple is the most antisocial company out there, yet is the number one selling business. Why? Because they listen to their customers. They take customer experience to the extreme. So when you get an Apple product, you get a beautiful experience. How much can you say that for all of the products that you're exposed to every day? How many times do you grab something in your hands and you go, wow, this is beautiful? That's what we're missing. That's what we're missing from products. Right? So I want people to tell me that my products are not working. Why? Because I can then go back to the developers and tell them, get your f***ing act together. You need to fix these problems because our customers are not going to run away to the competition. I don't want that to happen. So all of this opportunity to go and bitch on social networking tools about mm -hmm. things that work and don't work, if that bitching is constructed feedback, I love it. If it is negativity, if it is haters because they want to hate, I ignore it. Why? Because trolling is a very boring activity. I've got work to do, right? So that's the whole thing of how it changes from that perspective. Yeah, but then honestly, I don't see you know social tools being that much better as an email. They are as as prone to waste of time, as prone of being over flooded by crap information. So I don't see you know the benefits being so you know you present the social tools as being the one that save our work life and you know get us from the darkness to the Eden and I don't see that many advantages because they are yeah okay. still full of crap information unnecessary information and right so um, actually I typically get this kind of answer from people who want to play the devil's advocate I know that you're not I know that you're selling the whole argument but I like that because we get these questions out and everything else, right? So typically when someone comes to me saying that they don't see the value because there's too much noise, there's just, you know, they can't learn anything and they have got like too much pollution and everything else on their networks, I just go back to basics and I tell them, yeah, that's right, because you're hanging out on the wrong network. Simple. Right? I mean, let's face it, do you guys have got crappy friends? 
Do you got friends who do not give you any value? Face to face, in real life. Do you have any of those friends? Do you? And I'm not talking about acquaintances. I'm talking about friends, true friends. The ones that you can count with your fingers. And probably you run out of fingers. Or maybe you don't even run out of fingers in one hand, right? You don't have crappy friends. You build relationships, meaningful relationships with those friends. Because they're part of your life. You need to trust them. Social networks are exactly the same thing. What happens is that you amplify the effect by having the whole world as your potential friend. And I'm not talking about Facebook friends, yeah? So my comment to that is, if that's how you feel about your networks, that's you're hanging out with your networks in a way that you shouldn't be. They're not providing you enough value. Now to give you an example, I have got very visible external profiles on you know, Twitter, Google Plus, or whatever else, internally as well. In fact, I have got heavier presence internally than externally. And people tell me, you know, how do you make sense out of your network? How do you separate noise from signal? And I tell them, I don't. To me, they're all signals. It's 16 years of hard work every day building personal relationships with the people who matter to me and my needs, just like I do back to them. That's what it is. It's hard work. Don't tell me wrong. Social networking tools are very hard to build those kind of relationships. But once you have those relationships, oh, the, boy just, the world just gets better. Why? Because all what they will provide you is meaningful content. It's not rubbish. Right? Now, here's the thing. Um, is you might say, yeah, but that takes me time, that takes me effort, that takes me all sorts of different things. So, yes, it does. But here's the thing. When two years ago, McKinsey did a study um, in corporate America, although I think that we can, call, you know, we can take it here to Europe as well. Even for, you know, this was like large enterprise, so we will see how you guys feel on small and medium businesses, right? So McKinsey did a study where they queried the average time that people spend doing email per year, right? And that was 81.5 days, so 650 hours per year, are dedicated just to just do email. So think about it: three out of three and a half out of your 12 months, they're wasted doing email already today. And some people will tell me, "Oh my God, mine is a lot more than that." And some other ones will say, "No, I only have like two, three emails per day. So I'm okay, right?" But here's the thing: so with that piece of data. I said to myself, okay, I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment. So last year, I religiously timed every time that I would have spent internally doing social networks. So getting my work done using social networking tools. So I timed that religiously, right? And funny enough, at the end of the year, I counted all of the minutes, all of the hours, and all of the days, and I came up with 35 days. Think about that. Using email, 81.5. Using social networks, 35. Ironic, right? People tell me, yeah, but I'm going to be so overwhelmed, and yet I'm doing two times less work through social networks than through email. So when people tell me, okay, so what is the return on investment from all of these social networking tools? And I say, how about two times faster, more efficient, more productive than what you are doing email? How about that? And they go like, well, prove it to me. So here it is. Here's how I have done it. Now, the big thing about doing that is that while I have made that switch, all of my knowledge, all of my content is out there on the networks. So those networks can actually be self-sufficient and self-serving without my knowledge. I don't know whether you know it, and if you Googled Milos in advance, but he's not a famous football player, but he's, I think, our most famous social media celebrity in this country. So... What, are you in such a passion relationship she, she, with the social media as well? She googled something funny. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with, uh, with this. I, can't, I don't have anything to say again. I think it's right. Yeah. So you think it's better to spend time on social media than emailing? It's I don't know. More I, I really don't spend very much time uh, doing email. Um, so I, I don't have any... I can't say. I can't say. And uh, the truth is, many people ask me because you are using uh, social media quite heavily. Uh, you have to spend a lot of time. 
uh, which is not true. Uh, I'm really spending uh, maybe, I don't know, 40 minutes a day, maybe less, because I'm 40, doing... 40 minutes a day? Maybe, maybe less, I don't know. I'm using it... Uh, so let me, let me stop you there for a second. No, I, then let me finish this. Hang sentence. on, hang on. This is important, believe me, trust me. My sentence is important as well. <laughs> he, he's no, bigger. Go on. You no, are, you are he's bigger, so... Yeah. You are the guest. The Spanish people, go on. Go on, go on. Finish the thought. I forgot my sentence. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> so um, I know that you haven't forgotten. I know that you had it there. So I appreciate that you're willing me to let you interrupt you there for a second. So how many of you spend more than one hour on email every day? Raise your hand. Thank you. That was my point of view. And you spend 40 minutes on social networks. Carry on. Everybody wants to make you happy. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> this is not about. This is not about making. Well, but my point is that uh, I'm really a heavy user, and but and I'm using these things uh, uh, in the situations I usually before was reading newspaper or just uh, staring in uh, uh, into nowhere. So I'm doing it in I don't know in public transport. I'm doing it in the bathroom. I'm doing it um, uh, before I go to sleep. Sometimes in the bed. So I'm doing it. It's not, uh, I don't know, wasting my time in, in any way, or I, at least I think. So, yes, I think it's an effective tool, and uh, I, I would agree even that it's the hard work, but it's not the hard work doing it. It's the hard work, like socially, and it was hard work in the last century just uh, making your relationships in other way. So it's, it's not the technology issue. Right, and, and I agree with you. Actually, you say something which I find fascinating when talking about the whole concept on the future of work. Right. Um, it's interesting to see how plenty of people still think that work is a physical office, right? It's what you do when you go on checking in the office, nine to five, and then you leave at five, and then work lives behind, right? Pardon? That's right. That's right. I do have a physical. <laughs> I do have a physical job, but have you noticed how work is a verb? It's not a place. You work. You don't have an office that is called work, right? So what I'm trying to say with that is that yet some of us will have the need to physically go into the office, but work does not stop in the boundaries of the office building, right? Works where you go. So what Milos was trying to say there, which I think is absolutely spot on, is that work does no longer, or is no longer a physical space, it's a mental state. You will get your work done wherever you are. And one of the good things that these social networking tools are doing, and especially using smartphone devices or tablet devices, is that I can now carry work with me wherever I go. And then people tell me, oh, I'm freaking out now because that means that I'm going to even work after the office hours. Not necessarily. Because people will tell you, well, what about work-life balance? And I will tell them, wake up. There isn't work-life balance. Work will always win, regardless. What you need to think about is work-life integration, where you do work when you need to do it, but you also know how to switch off from everything. So I keep telling people, okay, describe it to me. And I say, well, you know, sometimes because of work pressures, you will have to put together 15, 16 hours of work every day for one or two weeks. Then one does, one done, once that deadline is over and finished, you may work the following two or three days, one or two hours a day. What's wrong with that? Now people tell me, well, does the company allow you to do that? Yes. Why? Because my company understands that you measure people not by what they look like at the office, but by the results that they provide at the end of the day. And I know that this is something that for you guys will sound like common sense. It is not. That's the reason why we still have to go to the office every day. But do you because really know our managers don't yeah. trust us. Yeah. But do you really know a company where this works in a larger scale? Because you know, looking at IBM, there is still a bunch of hundreds of people stuck in the Prague office of IBM and other offices and headquarters of IBM. So do you know any other company where they manage to have this the work as a mental concept, not as a physical concept? There are some companies out there. Obviously, like I said, this pretty much depends on the job role. Right. Um, I can see, for instance, where if you are working with a rather closed, collocated team, that you would want to still go into the office. Right. But for instance, if you're a salesman, if you're a consultant, you probably have to spend more time in the customer side than you will have to do at the IBM building from that perspective. Right. 
uh, all the companies who are doing it, I actually know companies who are not doing it. I, I know that Yahoo is not doing well, it. They're changing it, don't, don't they? Say, pardon? They have changed it, or the CEO announced yeah. that she's changing Yeah, she's the changing policy. everything, yeah. and she wants people to go back to work at the office. And everyone goes and says, like, my God, how can an internet company like Yahoo tell everyone to go to the office? And I, I may see, I may be the only one who sees this, but I think that that is the best piece of marketing that any company has done in centuries. Why? Because everyone is talking about it. Here we are, talking about Yahoo, telling people to go back to the office. It's a brilliant marketing stunt. Marisa, people Marisa, have been using Yahoo homepage uh, than uh, before. <laughs> no, but you know what? It's, it's interesting because if you notice, if I ask you a year ago what you thought about Yahoo, you probably thought that they were a bunch of losers. And yet today we're talking about a bunch of losers them. in the office. Yeah. <laughs> no, not anymore. No, no, no. At the home no, because they were they were they were working virtually before, right? So they were working before remotely and everything else. But then obviously. You know how things work, right? So you have to put together marketing campaigns. And to me, this, this is like the biggest marketing campaign. Yes, okay, Marista's saying that everyone has to go to the office. To me, that's a wake-up call for her employees. She's telling them, get your fucking act together and do work. And I'm going to force you to change your mentality that you have been slacking off. Now, when you start delivering results, you can go and do the same thing. So I bet that in one or two, three years, she's going to tell people you can go and work wherever you want. Why? Because she will have the energy back. Right now, what she has is a whole bunch of disengaged employees. That's what she's got, right? So all the companies that are doing it, do you guys know the Dutch tax office? You probably don't, right? So the Netherlands have got the tax office. They're moving the entire workforce to mobile. They're giving them iPads and iPhones to work mobile and not work from the office. Why? Because apart from reducing costs, it will help the actual clerks to do much more efficient work, having to stop telecommuting or commuting to the office every day and then just do the work where they are. I repeat, Dutch tax office. Can the Czech Republic government do that? They're doing it in the Netherlands, right? And I'm talking about an organization that has been there for over 150 years. I have to say, our political situation is very mobile. It keeps changing all the time, so. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, now here's, here's one thing though. Um, something that to you guys is like common thing, but to me it was a shock this morning. You know, I was coming with Lucy, and, and she said, you know, do you want to walk, or do you want to go and take the tram? And I thought like, well, it's a bit cold to walk. Um, so I'll take the tram. I haven't been in the tram yet, so I'll go and take the tram. So she has her mobile phone, and I thought like, oh, she's going to make a phone call, right? And then I, and I ask her, okay, what do we do with the tickets? I said, no, I already got them. I put them to the mobile phone. I thought like, what? I said, can I have that in Spain, please? I can't not. I have to go to the ticket office. And here you guys go with the mobile device, lovely. Here are the two tickets on the tram, perfect. That's innovation. That's taking things onto the next level. That's helping, you know, I mentioned earlier on about the people experience, about building experiences around your products. This is what social networking is all about. This is what mobile devices are doing for us. They're helping us regain control of what we do and how we work on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's impacting our lives as well. I mean, if I would have had to get my ticket for the tram, I would have lost my first appointment this morning. And yeah, there she was with the mobile, boom, boom, boom. Okay, I got the ticket, says, hop out. In two minutes, in two minutes. And I know you guys are saying, yeah, this guy is really stupid. Come on, we've been doing that for years. <laughs> and I will tell you, yeah, come back to Spain and I'll show you what the tram experience is over there. And you will have fun, yeah? And then obviously, maybe you struggle with the language even at all. And yeah? So you see what I mean with this? So it's, this, is, this is helping us as well rethink how we live as societies. You know, it's, it's instead of sort of like trying to always be in control by what other people will tell you, is you taking control of how you work. It's taking more responsibility for your actions. It's helping build stronger networks that help you share that knowledge across and collaborate much more effectively, right? Let me ask you something here. I take, obviously, is anyone here who doesn't have any social networking profile? Who doesn't have any. So you don't have any social presence at all. Anyone here? You see? It's happening already, 
right? No, but why do I say that? So let me ask you, then this is, this is, that was an easy question. I'm going to go for the more dangerous one. How many of you would trust your work to your networks in a blind second, in a split second? How many of you would tell your networks, hey, do your work for me, please, while I'm gone? How many of you will be able to do that? Crowdsourcing. Yeah, you could say crowdsourcing. No, using social networks to delegate things instead of email. You are, yeah. Yeah, it's How many of you would do that? You would do it? One person in the entire room. Actually, two, because I'm the other one. You know, if you work on your networks, if you nurture them, if you make them visible to them, if they know what you're good at, what your expertise is, the kinds of interactions that you do, you will reach a level of trust where you can rely on them entirely, right? So I'll give you an example, and maybe we can share notes and see if this is some example that you may have, right? So um, at the end of last year, well, typically I take my, my holiday on Christmas, my major holidays, right? And where people from Gran Canary go for a holiday? To Gran Canaria. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent, I spent home four weeks of vacation, right? The last two weeks of December, the first two weeks of January. So typically what happens when you come back from vacation? What do you do? The first thing that you come back from vacation, what do you guys do? Delete our emails. Check your emails. And how many of those emails do you have? Okay. Wow. Wonderful. Can you, can you say that on the mic? Can you say, explain it again? Again, I uh, create a special file uh, named delete. Right. <laughs> delete. There's an incentive already. <laughs> yes. Delete. And I move all my messages from inbox to this file. And I right. react only on a message which uh, somebody asked me, please, uh, I send you email uh, during your vacation. Please ask for How many of you are doing what she's doing? Two people. Two other people. Does it work? Yes. So that, that already, and then, and then he goes, perfect, brilliant. So that already tells me that we do have an issue with email, right? But the example that I was mentioning earlier on about the crowdsourcing your work. So I went away for one full month. So this is 30 days, actually it was 27 days that I was gone from work, right? And I told my networks, hey, I'm going to be away from work. Look after me. That's important words. Look after me, right? So I didn't check email, don't have email, right? And I didn't check my networks, what they were doing. So 27 days later, I came back to work and obviously didn't have those hundreds of emails. Like I said, I don't get any or hardly any. But I did, have, I did go back to my networks and say, hey guys, wonderful time on vacation, I enjoyed it, recharge my batteries. What happened since I've been gone? What have I missed? Now, my network, internal network, I've got 3,100 people, right? It's a heavy network, right? Only one person responded back. Only one did respond back. And then this person is someone from my networks, obviously, right? And then he said, look, this topic is really hot. This other topic is really hot. So you may want to have a look and check them out. For the rest, move on. What did I do? I moved on. Three months later, I haven't had a single interaction from that month that I have been away. Not even on my social networks. And Luis, doesn't it mean that the evangelist is doing basically the same thing on vacation and he's working? <laughs> <laughs> you could say that. You could say that. But, but um, it's, more, it's more interesting because, and this, this came up on a conversation that we had earlier on this morning, what I'm trying to prove with that is that when you go on vacation, the company moves on. Work will continue. If someone sends you an email because they need help from you, if you're away because they have got the out-of-office message, they're going to go to your next door colleague and ask the same question and they're going to get the answer. Yet you're the one stuck with email, right? Mm -hmm. So if we apply that mentality that work will continue whether I'm there or not, we no longer become the bottleneck. We are actually part of the network. We're no longer the center of the network. We are actually part of the network. And that means that we can liberate ourselves 
from whatever the interactions because I can just incorporate myself into the flow as I come back from work. Yeah? Just one comment before we had, you know, thinking about the number of Milos followers, I'm wondering who is actually writing your articles. Because you keep traveling quite a lot, so does it work the same way as with Luis? What do you mean? <laughs> that there are people who take care of your articles while well, you, and you are managing I'm them. I'm a graphomaniac, so that's no problem <laughs> to write the articles for me. Okay. So maybe we, I think now, now we have time for questions, so well, keep asking questions. Uh, just, just one note, you, you asked previously if we would rely our, uh, on our social network to do our work for us. Hmm. And maybe I would rephrase it, I, uh, I would rely on my network to do the work without me but not for me. Uh, I, I want and I'm trying to share enough knowledge and experience so I know that when I'm not there they can carry on, they can do the work, but not for, not actually my work, but they can carry on without me. That's an excellent point and thanks for correcting me because you are absolutely right because the way I rephrased it or the way I phrased it, that would mean that you will have a bunch of slaves working for you as opposed to a bunch of colleagues working with you. So you are 100% right that this is what it's all about. The way I describe it as well is how, how you can help your networks become self-sufficient and self-serving from your knowledge. So you try to provoke them to not go and ask you questions by making your knowledge and information readily available. Right. So I'm going to describe it that with one example because that's probably how we can better relate. So imagine that you are that thought leader, right, on the particular subject expertise that you may have. And you bump into one of these salespeople who tells you, hey, I, I would love to have this lovely fancy presentation that you did for my customer and everything else. Can I have it, right? Typically that person responding through email will say, yeah, here's the presentation or here's the link to the presentation. Now, if you proactively switch that into the world of networks, you can go one time to your networks and say, hey, from now onwards, you can find my presentations on my file sharing space. Whether it's SharePoint, whether it's Dropbox, whether it's Jive, whether it's connections from IBM or whatever else, I don't care, right? Now, what you're doing there is that whenever someone needs your information, they won't ask you. They will go to your online social presence and they will go and see if you have that information and if you have it, they will go and download it and reuse it and if not, that's when they will ask you. That's working with you. Right? That's helping your networks benefit from your knowledge without asking you. The main benefit of doing that is reduce, reducing friction. We're having far too many frictions. Right? So if I can proactively go and share my knowledge to avoid people asking me the same question over and over again, what it means is that I'm also freeing up time to work on more complex problems. And therefore, rebuild my knowledge onto a level, different level and then share back again to the network, right? So in that context, I tell you what happens with me constantly every single day and that's the fact that inside of the company we have our own social network running and we do have similar interactions to what you could do with Facebook where you can leave messages in people's boards, right, on people's walls. So I have reached a state where by nurturing those relationships with my networks People actually go into my profile to ask questions and my network is the one who answers. That's the ultimate goal of trust. Both parties, they trust the interaction on my space. And I may be there and I may not be there. If I'm there, I can help provide the answer if I'm fast enough or at least faster than others. But if I'm not there, the one who gains the most benefit is me. Why? Because when I come back, I have got a question and I've got an answer. I may know the question, but if I don't know the question and I learn about the answer, without asking, I already know something. So the next time that someone asks me that question, I know, oh yeah, this conversation we had it on my board like two, three weeks ago or two, three, six months ago, here's the answer, right? So that's working with my network versus for my network kind of thing, right? So that's, that's an excellent comment, thank you. More questions? Yeah, you, you touched it in the in in, in your speech already. I think uh, the paramount for that is not to being overflowed by the information. You mentioned you have thirty one hundred uh, in your network, mm -hmm. so uh, it's not a little amount. It's not just your friends on your finger. Mm -hmm. So you probably got lots of buzz in there. Right. And second thing is the the good thing on the email is that's one platform. We have many social platforms, 
and how do we cope with that in the future? Because right. then you got your friends on Facebook, right. on Google Plus, on Tumblr, and uh, what do you what do you think is be behind the fact that uh, now the young generation is moving away from Facebook, mm -hmm. going to Tumblr? So, so in terms of the information overload, with having such a heavy network, um, I don't have that feeling of information overload. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I don't read everything that comes through to me, right? I have learned to adjust to the fact that it is impossibly human for me to read everything that I get exposed to every day. It was the same on email, by the way, yeah? What happens is that I have learned to rely on my networks to collaboratively filter the content that I need and find relevant. So for instance, on that network that I have internally, not everyone shares, but everyone reads and participates, right? In their own domain kind of thing. So instead of having like 3,000 messages, I probably get like around 10% of that. 10% for that for me is like five minute coffee. In fact, I spend 20 minutes in the morning 20 minutes in the afternoon, 20 minutes in the evening. So that's an hour per day, right, for a heavy network. The average number of connections that people have in the company right now is 40 people. So from 60, that will probably be like 10 minutes, and they will still get that information. So it's not really that information overload. Why? Because that collaborative filtering takes place, right? You bring in a very good point on the second question about the various different networks. You bring in a very good point that fragmentation is there. Um, however, the interesting thing that I'm really excited about is how cognitive science is coming into the workplace, right? <clears throat> and it's actually some of the recent research that has been done is, is that it has, they have been able to demonstrate how our brains work better in fragmentation than as a whole. So we can make much better sense interacting in multiple social networks than just with one inbox. We make better decisions thinking in small fragments versus one giant fragment, right? So when, for instance, when you need, imagine that you have got your inbox as your only entry point. So when you need to look for something, you may have the situation where you're going to be challenged to find the actual content because of how much noise you have, right? But if I ask you, say that you want to find some really cool images, where would you go except Facebook? Facebook does not work with me as an example. So if you want to find really cool images for your presentations, where would you go? Google. Yeah, Google is a search engine. It doesn't work. And I'm talking about a social network. Where would you go? Flickr. Exactly. What else can you do in Flickr? Yeah, what else can you do in Flickr? I don't know why I look... Um, of course you don't know. Nothing else. Nothing else. <laughs> you cannot do anything else on Flickr. The only reason why you will go to Flickr is find pictures. That's it. The same thing with delicious. The only reason why you will go to delicious is to find links. Right? So, will you, you see what I meant with fragmentation? Is that depending on the context of what I want to do and what I want to find, I will go for one network or the other. So, if I want to ask a quick question where I want to have an answer almost in real time, where would I go? with my networks, or where do you think I will go? If I have got like a quick question, like I have got like a technical problem, and I know that this is like a quick fix answer, where do you think that I can go? Your email, maybe, no? No, that mobile phone is not mine. I think it's not mine. Someone, okay, no worries. So I'll go to Twitter. I'll go and ask a question on Twitter, and within a matter of seconds, I'll have several answers back in one single page, right? So that's how we fragment our interactions and how we become more focused on how we get our answers based on that context, right? So on the issue that you mentioned about fragmentation, fragmentation is not necessarily bad. The key message there, though, we, we still have to provide, so this is where we have the room for improvement in social networks, is to be able to create a federation of networks. So regardless where you are, that content gets shared across the various different networks. Unfortunately, that federation hasn't taken place, right? You mentioned different social networks with different purposes, but they are competing social networks like Facebook, Google. They are competing social networks. Yeah. According so to what whom? Do you, what do you, according to whom? No, according to the content of what's in there. Not really. Okay. Let's, no, keep elaborating. Let me see if I can, if I can get the, the more The fact that you. you go for the social network for the pictures to Flickr, that's, yeah. 
that's the main reason of the social network is for right. pictures, the right? The purpose. Delicious, yeah. the same. Yeah. But then you have Facebook, you have some friends on Facebook, then you have Google <coughs> Plus, you have different friends on the, on, the, on the Google Plus, mm -hmm. then maybe you have friends with young generation mm -hmm. on, on Tumblr, right. and then you then you work in three different social networks that are mm -hmm. basically um, for collaboration, information sharing, um, online talking, okay. et cetera, et cetera. So those right. are not specific social network for some specific content. So let me ask you, um, by trying to answer your question, your comment, I'm going to ask you, isn't that what you do in real life as well? Don't you have different circles of friends around you, or they're all one single pile? Uh, yeah, I understand it, but the fact is that I can have one good friend right. on Facebook and the same type of a good friend on Google. Right. It's not like that the Google friends are not that good friends as a Facebook friend. No, no, but, no I mean? that's, that's right, and you're right. But what I'm trying to say with that is that we make that logical separation of our circles of friends. So we have got one group of friends that I know I can share specific conversations and another kind of friends that I can share only other specific conversations. That role also happens in social networks, right? I'm not just defining it that it's a right behavior. I'm saying that what we do in real life is also something that we do virtually. I agree with you, for instance, that those social networks are competing, not because of competing amongst themselves, they're competing for something bigger, much bigger, the biggest thing, which is your attention. They're competing for your attention, is how much time can I spend on those tools? And the answer to that question is not on the tool itself. It depends on the interactions that you're having with your friends, right? So, for instance, one of the things that has surprises plenty of people is that as a social computing and social business evangelist, I deleted my Facebook account three years ago. And I haven't walked back. And then people, how can you be an evangelist if you don't use Facebook? And I said, well, because my networks do not live in Facebook. They don't. I go where my networks are, regardless of the tool or the technology. Right? If someone of my networks comes and tells me, hey, I'm loving Pinterest, you're going to join me. And I go like, well, let's have, a good, like, let's have a go and play with it and see how it goes. Unfortunately, right now, I don't have anyone from my networks telling me, let's go on Pinterest. Right? However, I do have the other thing. I have a couple of my networks who have been tied themselves to using Facebook and they're moving into Tumblr. And we go to Tumblr. Right? So I basically become part of that flow where collectively we decide where our, new, our next hangout place is from that perspective. So, so, so you believe it's going to be a, where the mass flows we follow and then, you know... Where your network flows, not the mass, where your network flows, right? So that's what's going to dictate that attention from that perspective. Maybe his network is just massive. <laughs> maybe his network is massive, <laughs> no, no. right? So maybe his network is massive and, that, and he will go and fluke to a where your networks are. But you, you, know, see, you see what I'm trying to say here? What I'm trying to say here is that the technology is not important, should not be important. The technology should be an enabler of the conversations that you're having. And whether you're using Facebook, Tumblr, Google+, Plus, Twitter, whatever, it won't matter. That's irrelevant. It's, it's how you nurture those conversations and those relationships. I understand. It's a change of the mindset and, yeah. and culture of the people. On the other side, uh, one of the main advantages of the social, social network is where the content stays, if, even though when you can see your profile. Mm -hmm. uh, the point is that when we're going to be moving, we're missing the federation fact, right? So... Basically, if everybody goes out of the Facebook Facebook, Facebook bankrupt, then they close it down, and the, all yeah. the knowledge there, where it is, is, is gone. So, yeah. So, what do you the think is going to be the future of the right. federation things? So that's probably the reason why I'm not on Facebook. That I don't have to worry what's happening to my <laughs> content after it's deleted, right? I I actually, there was a reason why I didn't I, I deleted the account on Facebook, I, but the, I think on. yeah, we have just few minutes, so I okay. would like to give opportunity to other people who would like to ask questions. So. Yeah. And we can come back to that one. Later. Is there anyone who wants to share his question? More questions, comments, feedback? Yeah, on the back. If you're asking me, if you're asking me, so so the question was so that it goes into into the live broadcast. Um, so how long did it take me to implement this kind of new way of working inside of IBM? If you're asking me 480,000 employees, <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I keep telling people that the good evangelist, 
the one that is really super wonderful, awesome evangelist, is that one that makes his job or her job obsolete. <laughs> so you basically, whenever you see me jobless, that means that I'm complete, right? If you think about the 480,000 employees, right? If you think about the groups of people and teams of people that I work with, which is actually a rather extensive number, it took me between five to six months of constantly educating them, yeah? Remember that what I'm doing here is I'm going from one single box where everything happens to find different little boxes that depending on the context we will go to one or the other. So initially I spent a good amount of time educating people on what the new tools will be like. Remember as well that this was five years ago, right? So when I ask the question, any of you who don't have a social profile out there, I always do this question for the last five years, and I remember when I did it the five, five years ago, that the vast majority of people would raise their hand. Five years later, none of you raise your hand. So if you start doing it today, the friction that I had at the beginning, you won't have it. Because people are already using these tools in some form or shape already. So it's a matter of focusing the work-related interactions versus just the personal interactions and private interactions. That's, that's the magic switch. And you can do that by focusing on use cases. So how do you work in your day-to-day work? So how do you use email today, for instance? And then pick up some of those interactions and move them into social spaces. Yeah? And lots of patience. Lots maybe, of patience. Maybe it would be interesting to ask the same question to your colleagues. <clears throat> how, how do they cope with uh, the fact that you don't have the email? Mm. Doesn't it make the work uh, with, with you I much actually, more hard? I actually asked them that. Um, not recently, which helps me to bring that conversation back to them, right? But I actually did that at the beginning of how they felt when I was the one, the old one, right? The awkward one, the one not using email, right? And <clears throat> they were telling me that uh, they thought it was weird. They thought that it was very strange that this guy is sitting in Gran Canaria telling me in my IBM office that I can no longer use email, right? And they were basically telling me, like, what is this social business thing? I don't understand it. So if you want me to walk there, you will need to guide me. And that's essentially what I did, right? What, what I'm trying to say with that is that the vast majority of times, if you ask people why they do certain things, they will tell you. If you don't ask them, they won't just, you know, common sense. But what I'm trying to say with that is that sometimes you need to ask proactively people how they feel about what you're doing with work and everything else, right? So I think there are the ladies in the front row who were the one who were arranging your trip to Czech Republic, so you all are free to go and ask them what were their experience and whether they didn't wish you are yeah, using email. Absolutely, and, 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 and they will tell you that we <laughs> have <laughs> already asked. Yeah, we have, we have already asked. <laughs> but and we are well, inviting them, others Absolutely, and, and they will tell you that we use instant messaging, that we use the phone, we use text messaging, we use LinkedIn, we use a whole bunch of other different tools. And guess what? I'm here today with you guys. Mm. <laughs> so so they are exhausted. <laughs> Pardon? They are exhausted. Yes. They need holiday. Uh, well, they don't have five weeks on Canary Islands. <laughs> Ask them that. Uh, well, you know, they're more than welcome to come over to Grand Canaria. You know, like I said, I, I keep telling, you know, people tell me, oh my God, I did another, IBM had an office in Grand Canaria. I say, yeah, my house. Lovely mm -hmm. house. I've so got we, a nice, lovely mm -hmm. office room in there with Wi-Fi for everyone that can cope until we explode it, so you're happy to come over and hang out okay. there. Right? So I, we hope you keep your promise. I yes. hope you enjoyed the discussion, even though it was not about football. Yes. I think, as you could see, Luis is well-rested from not being as tired as us answering all the emails, so I think you are more than welcome to talk to him even after the end of the discussion or are free Absolutely. to go back to your emails. And please follow both guys on any social media because when they go on holiday, need, they need people to work for them. So please follow them. They need you. Good. Good evening. And I, I will say one final comment. Um, those of you who use Twitter, there's a hashtag that I have going there, which is L-A-W-W-E, as in live a while without email. I'm giving free support to anyone, including competitors, if you want to make the move. So feel free to reach out to me on that so channel. So free support means the visit to Grand Canary, or what is this free support? Free support means that you ask me a question and I'll provide the answer. And if okay. I don't know the answer, I'll invite you to come over to Grand Canary. Yeah? 
So thank you guys for being here today. Have a nice evening.